It's 6 p.m. on a Tuesday here in Korea. Welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's start with the headlines. In her first cabinet meeting of the year, President Park Geun-hye renewed her call for economic growth through reform, emphasizing the need to work for the people and the nation. The presidential office and the parliament seem to be set on a collision course after engaging in a war of words over how a package of economy reviving bills should be handled. Despite early concerns following the stock market rout in China on Monday, China's benchmark index appears to be stabilizing. Even so, officials in Korea vowed to monitor any fluctuations in the global market and the possible repercussions for Korea. At the nation's top office, President Park Geun-hye laid out a roadmap for this year's policies at her first cabinet meeting of the year. In addition to calling on the parliament to work for the people, she stressed the need to root out corruption in order for the economy to make a leap forward. Song ji sun has our top story. As she entered her fourth year in office, President Park Geun-hye renewed her call for economic growth through reform saying she and her administration will do all they can for the people and the nation for the remainder of her term. The president asked the cabinet members to work to improve the livelihoods of the public. She asked for the same efforts from the National Assembly, which has yet to vote on a package of economy-related bills, including the one on labor reform, that she has actively promoted. She repeated her call for lawmakers to both pass the bills and work for the people they represent. 이대로 국회가 문을 닫는다면 청년 일자리의 문도 닫히게 되고 대한민국의 미래도 닫히게 됩니다. 부디 새해에는 국회와 정치권 모두 진심으로 국민을 위해 힘을 모으고 신뢰를 얻게 되기를 바랍니다. President Buck added that Korea should have more confidence in the economy, citing a report by the UK-based Center for Economics and Business Research that says Korea will overtake most Western European countries to become one of the world's top five economies at some point in the 2030s. She also called on her administration to root out corruption, saying outdated misdeeds stand as obstacles to her plans for strengthening the Korean economy through deregulation and reform. Song Ji-sun, Arirang News. The president's call to the parliament and lawmakers' ongoing impasse over the two major pending issues, a package of livelihood bills and the redrawing of the country's electoral map, has deepened a rift between the two. Shin Zemin has the details. In the deepening row between the presidential office and the parliament, the presidential office of Chung Ade denounced the National Assembly Speaker Chung Iwa, accusing him of playing politics with little regard for the economy. The presidential office on Tuesday refuted Chung Ing-hwa's claim that it had urged him to tie two pending issues together and make progress on both before the current parliamentary session ends this week. It said it only urged him to put a package of stalled livelihood bills up for a vote. Chung said he has no intention to use his authority as a speaker to bring the bills to the floor for a vote, possibly signaling a protracted confrontation with the nation's top office. After annual gathering of political leaders at the presidential office Monday, Chung had said the presidential office had pushed him to tie the livelihood bills to a resolution on the country's electoral map. He said he told Chief Secretary Lee Byung-hee the two issues should be handled separately and the presidential office shouldn't be pushing to tie them together. Critics say the feud is diverting attention from the two main issues at hand, and time is running out, with less than four days left until the current parliamentary session ends on Friday. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Korea's current account surplus streak is now into its 45th consecutive month, meaning the nation's trade balance has consistently been in the black for nearly four years. The Bank of Korea says the country posted a surplus of 9.4 billion U.S. dollars in November. That's higher than the surplus posted the previous month, but lower than over 10 billion dollar surplus re recorded in the same month in 2014. November's surplus came as inbound and outbound shipments dropped. Exports were down nearly 12 percent on year. Imports were over 15 percent lower due to plunging oil prices. The deficit in the service account, which includes tourism and shipping, also narrowed slightly in November from the previous month. 
And now turning over to China's stock market, where aftershocks from Monday's trading continues to linger, despite the year getting off to a bad start, especially considering that the first trading session is usually characterized by optimism. Chinese shares eventually leveled out a touch today. Kim min reports. China's benchmark index steadied after the carnage on Monday. There were early concerns that there could be more of the same as the Shanghai Composite Index opened more than 3 percent lower on Tuesday, but the index closed down 0.26 percent. The index tumbled a whopping 7 percent on the first day of trading of 2016 before China's new system-wide circuit breaker pulled the plug on trading. Thanks to China's attempts to get back on course, Korea shares also showed signs of recovery. The benchmark KOSPI added over 0.6 percent on Tuesday, bouncing back from a four-month low the day before. Earlier in the day, Korea downplayed the impact of Korea's stock market crash on the Seoul Bourse, with officials saying they will closely monitor fluctuations in the global market and its impact on the local economy. This follows overnight losses on Wall Street, with the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing down 1.6 percent from the previous close. The S&P 500 shed 1.5 percent, and the tech-heavy Nasdaq closed more than 2 percent lower. The Chinese market route came on the back of sluggish manufacturing activity in the country that cast a dark cloud over the world's second-largest economy. The official Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index fell for the 10th straight month to 48.2 for December, with the reading meaning a contraction in activity. Kim min Arirang News. The impact from Monday seems to be fading in world markets gradually, but there are still concerns about the stability of the world's second largest economy. Recent data imply that the road ahead may not be so smooth. For details, we turn to Lee Su China started showing signs of stability on Tuesday after sending shockwaves around the world when markets there crashed on Monday. But there are still a number of concerning risk factors for the country going forward. First is sluggish growth. A Bloomberg survey of economists show a median growth projection of 6.5 percent for China, well below its 7 percent target. On top of that, China's Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, or PMI, has been below the healthy level of 50 for 10 straight months, an implication that external demand for manufactured Chinese goods is on the decline. The slowdown in the Chinese economy comes from various structural elements that are a result of its transition from an investment-dependent economy to a consumption-centered one. Unless there are big changes in the domestic or foreign markets, growth in China will continue to slow. Next is the possibility of a continued drop in the value of the Chinese yuan. On Monday, markets closed with the yuan at nearly 6.52 against the greenback, the lowest on record since May 2011. Until now, the Chinese government has defended its currency devaluation by injecting foreign reserves into the market. But if foreign investors choose to pull capital out of China, triggered by a low yuan, this may no longer be possible. The Chinese market has gradually opened up in recent years with the launch of Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect in 2014 and the yuan's inclusion in the IMF's currency basket last year. With plans to further open its markets this year, including the Shenzhen Index and the MSCI Emerging Markets Index, increased volatility is expected. With corporate reformation on the Chinese government's agenda and the real estate market concerned about a double dip triggered by rising government debt and unstable banks, the Chinese economy has a rocky road ahead. Lee Su-wen, Arirang News. Salary for 2016 for government officials has been unveiled. President Bak Geun-hye will earn around 175,000 U.S. dollars this year, up roughly 6,000 from a year ago. The annual salary of Korea's prime minister is set at $140,000. That's also $4,500 more than 2015. The wages for ministers stand at around 100,000. The annual income for officials were decided during a cabinet meeting today. There, the government also raised wages for soldiers by 15 percent this year. 
China, for the first time, is using North Korea's Najin Harbor to ship food and supplies to its southern regions. Many experts say the port's location makes it ideal for future development as a maritime hub. And if Beijing has its way, it could become an important connecting point for President Xi's 21st century maritime Silk Road. Kim Yuan bin has this report. Chinese ships have been taking advantage of a new sea route using North Korea's Najin Harbor, and apparently the arrangement is working out. Jinao News Agency reported Tuesday that an estimated 600 tons worth of Chinese food and lumber was ported in Najin last year, en route to Shanghai. Jinao emphasized that Najin opens up a third major food supply route for Beijing, adding to its combination of pre-existing road, rail, and sea routes. In 2015, China's total food production reached over 620 million tons, with roughly 24 percent of those products coming from three northeast Chinese cities, including Qinlin and Liaoning. They account for a huge portion, considering there are only five cities in northeast China that are capable of exporting food supplies. Beijing began using the North Korean port after signing an agreement with Pyongyang in late 2000 for the right to use Najin and Chengjin harbors for up to 50 years. Initially, it used Najin to mainly export coal, but starting last year began to support shipments of other goods. Experts say as Chinese President Xi Jinping continues to push his One Belt, One Road initiative to develop a modern-day maritime Silk Road, Beijing will only ramp up its use of Najin. China is eagerly searching for a new trade route in the East Sea that is able to connect to the European market. Najin has grown to become one of North Korea's biggest international ports, and with this prime location in the northeast of the country, Many believe the city has the potential to develop into a Eurasia marine transport hub in the near future. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Controversies continues to swirl around the landmark agreement between Seoul and Tokyo to resolve the sensitive issue of Japan's wartime sexual enslavement of Korean women. And aside from the actual term of the deal and the lack of involvement from surviving victims, criticism is flaring over an alleged move to relocate a statue that symbolizes the plight of the so-called comfort women. Kim Ji-yeon follows us this report. Installed in 2011, the statue of a young girl in Korean dress symbolizes the many victims of sexual enslavement at the hands of Japanese troops before and during war, also known as so-called comfort women. The memorial statue has sat outside the Japanese embassy in Seoul for more than five years now and serves as a constant reminder of Tokyo's unresolved wartime atrocities. Replicas have been erected in different cities around the world as the international community has has become increasingly aware of history surrounding the issue. So it's no surprise the Japanese government is eager to get rid of or relocate the statue from plain sight. Tokyo has faced rising criticism for its lukewarm attitude in acknowledging its dark past. But despite its efforts, weekly protests demanding for Tokyo's sincere apology and legal responsibility for the atrocities have been held outside the Japanese embassy for 25 straight years. During the warm seasons, supporters often lay flowers around the statue while others wrap scars around it during the winter months. And every day, visitors are discovering more significance in the statue, including a shadow that's cast on the statue shows the shape of an elderly woman holding a butterfly to her chest. Some people on social networking sites say the silhouette signifies the many wishes that victims find peace despite their painful experiences and memories. Tokyo has repeatedly claimed that it agreed with Seoul to work towards relocating the statue when it negotiated an agreement on the sex slavery issue in late December. Seoul strongly refused Tokyo's claim, saying it never agreed to move the statue and that the move would raise questions about Japan's sincerity in settling the comfort women issue. Around 200,000 women, mainly for Korea and China, were forced to serve as sex slaves for Japanese troops during World War II. Kim Jiang, Arirang News. Elsewhere around the world, Saudi Arabia's allies in the region have joined the kingdom in severing diplomatic ties with Iran as the repercussions ripple out over Riyadh's execution of a leading Shia cleric. The escalating sectarian tensions are casting a long shadow over efforts to end the bloody conflicts in Syria and Yemen. For the latest, we turn to Sun jung -in. The Saudi government widened its rift with Iran on Monday by halting all flights and trade between the countries. 
we decided to cut off all diplomatic relations with Iran. We will also be cutting off all air traffic to and from Iran. We will be cutting off all commercial relations with Iran and we will uh, have a travel ban against people traveling to Iran. Saudi Arabia's closest Sunni allies follow the kingdom's lead. Bahrain and Sudan both announced that they were severing diplomatic ties with Iran. The United Arab Emirates didn't go as far but still downgraded its diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic. Relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran, two Middle Eastern powerhouses, have deteriorated following Riyadh's execution of Shiite cleric Nimle al-Nimle on Saturday, which led to an attack on the Saudi embassy in Tehran. UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon urged the two regional rivals to support peace efforts in Syria and Yemen, where the two countries back opposing sides. He called on both foreign ministers to avoid any actions that could further exacerbate the situation in the region. The Secretary General also reiterated that the attack on the Saudi embassy in Tehran was deplorable, but added that the announcement of a break in Saudi diplomatic relations with Tehran was deeply worrying. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry echoed Ban's concerns, reaching out to his counterparts from the two countries to urge calm and de-escalation. Amid the tension, the UN envoy for Syria is to visit both countries this week to gauge the impact of the crisis on efforts to convene peace talks later this month. Son Jong-in, Arirang News. And that's all for now. More updates coming up at 10 p.m. Korea time. Thank you for watching.